Music Industry Insights. Good evening and welcome to AM Insights. We welcome our absolutely ram-packed capacity live audience. Uh, we welcome people. Uh, tonight we welcome one of the true leaders of the Australian music industry. He's a writer, he's a managing director of a record company, and he's a manager of one of the truly iconic Australian bands of all time. I speak, of course, of John O'Donnell, otherwise known as J-O-D. Welcome, John. Thanks, Ed. It's mostly lovely to be here. So I'm curious to know, you know, you've signed some of the greatest Australian bands of all time, frankly. You had a long relationship with Silverchair. And yeah. It's a fascinating story because, you know, you literally signed them as effectively children. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and, and then sort of saw them go to the very height of the music industry and then to some degree, I suppose, come down the other side and, and, and that was a somewhat rocky path at times. It was incredible. They were in year nine at school. It was so exciting. They broke overseas really quite quickly, played at the MTV Awards in that first year, and suddenly it was all happening. None of this was scripted. We saw them at a place called Jules Tavern. When I say we, it was John Watson and myself. And we just drove home from Newcastle, Jules Tavern's a suburb of Newcastle. We just were wrapped absolute raving about them. The next morning he got up and wrote a whole marketing plan, like a, a five-page document um, that we emailed up to the parents of how we should develop this band. And mm. we said they shouldn't play Mickey Mouse shows, they should play with real bands. And that was the, the kind of template we set for the first two years of their life of don't play a show that sucks. One of my first things with Silverchair was I went and met with Ken West and Sahara and said, um, we just want to do the big day out. He said yes, and he came down and saw them at the Vulcan Hotel and was like, wow, I don't really, you know, I don't know if he loved them, but he loved what he saw um, and he loved the scene that was going on. It was absolute chaos. Um, and they played with UMI, they played with Regurgitator, they played with a whole bunch of bands because they just wanted to be on this path that was what a normal band should be doing. <clears throat> they struggled for credibility for a long time because people yeah. didn't want to take them seriously. Yeah. And I think if we did one thing well is we helped bring them that credibility and people weren't just saying it's all about their age. Yeah. You know, Nirvana in pyjamas and all those things. I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they had to defy all of those things yeah. and come on and put on good shows and they put on fantastic shows. But you, don't, you didn't have to like them. Um, but you couldn't deny them. We haven't even talked about Cold Chisel, which probably says a lot about your career, that we, we've got to this point and we forgot to mention one of the greatest Australian bands of all time, so we should just give them a moment at least. Absolutely. Um, an incredible band. A, an incredible band. And, I, you know, the thing about Cold Chisel, for those that weren't there to see it in, in, in first hand, you know, version one of Cold Chisel, the band that existed between 1976 and eighty two or so, yeah. was like watching a very, very fast runaway train um, yeah. with an extremely drunk driver um, that was at profound risk of going off the rails at any moment Yep, and literally exploded or imploded Yeah, um, and didn't work for many, many years because they, you know, frankly couldn't stand to be in the room together. Fast forward to today. I'm, I'm glad saying, you're I'm saying, saying all of this for and you. I'm not. Um, and, and, and fast forward to today where yeah. they are back on the road. They're recording again. Yeah. They've recorded three albums as, as a new unit. Um, sadly, and, not a full unit as they were. But, but, you know, it's an incredible story really, isn't it? It is. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, I think that early period, and I was lucky enough to see them play a lot of shows, uh, only ever as a punter, um, they absolutely blew my mind. They were so punk in their attack um, as musicians and as a band, but they had the classic songwriting of um, Don Walker and it evolved to other members in the band becoming good writers as well. And I'm not mentioning the rhythm section. You know, <laughs> the drummer was the strongest force of them all. <laughs> but um, anyway, so 
they had all of those elements pushing and pulling in all different directions, but they knew they had something great. They knew that when they were cold chisel on the stage, there was magic there that didn't happen with other bands. And Rod Willis, who managed them before and, and kind of who retired, he was amazing. And he, he, would, he did things that other people don't do. Like we released an album in December last year that came in at number five on the Ari Chats. So it was a live album recorded at the Bondi Lifesaver and it captures that mania that you spoke of. <laughs> Music, 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 music. Music industry insights.